Okay, and welcome. Uh, I'm, my name is Maya Allison. I'm the Executive Director of the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery. And I am delighted tonight uh, to launch our first public event in, collabor in collaboration with the Institute, Geographies of Modernism, Considering the Modern, the modern Through uh, India, Iran, and Turkey. This event is presented by the NYU AD Institute in collaboration with the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery. And we're delighted to have this opportunity to uh, deepen the conversation around the question of modernism in art history. And it's a question that is um, that has been percolating throughout art history conversations um, across the field, but also emerges in this exhibition, Modernisms, which is just opened at the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery um, just a few weeks ago. The exhibition was organized by Lynn Gumpert, who is our moderator tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce her. She has been the director of the Gray Art Gallery, which is New York University's Fine Arts Museum. Since 1997, she has overseen more than 70 exhibitions of the Gray. From 1980 to 1988, she was curator and senior curator at the New Museum of Contemporary Art. And as a writer, she authored the first major monograph on French artist Christian Boltanski and has contributed essays to numerous publications. In June of 1999, Ms. Gumpert was honored by the French government with the distinction of Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters. It's my great pleasure to welcome Lynn Gumpert and uh, to enjoy this conversation. Thank you, Maya. Um, it's great to visit um, virtually, um, and we're thrilled to be able to have the exhibition that we organized back in 2019 to travel to the art gallery at NYU Abu Dhabi. And um, I hear that the installation is fantastic and I'm hoping to visit. We're thrilled also to have with us um, two, three authors who contributed to the catalog, um, which should be available hopefully at the NYU AD Gallery. And we thought it would be great to have a conversation this evening in Abu Dhabi this morning in New York about what we've learned from participating in this exhibition and how scholarship has developed over the years in terms of looking at global modernisms. In this case, um, three areas in particular, Iran, India, and Turkey. Um, I should just say quickly that the exhibition itself um, is based on the collection of Abby Weed Gray, who was the founder of the Gray Art Gallery, um, as Maya said, NYU's Fine Arts Museum. And she donated 700 works um, in 1975, and that established the Gray Art Gallery along with an endowment. Um, and she had started collecting in, the, in 1960. Um, she, was, she grew up in Minnesota um, and when she inherited money um, un unknowingly, she wasn't aware that her husband had been investing. Um, and she was all of 54 years old, still young. Her husband had been two decades older than her. Um, she realized that she wanted to have a mission and that mission would be to collect non-Western modern art, contemporary art at the time and she embarked on a trip around the world in 1960. Um, and during that trip, she traveled to the three countries under discussion, um, India, Iran, and Turkey. She returned to Iran eight times, uh, Turkey four times, and India four times. So um, the format for this discussion will be um, presentations, short presentations on one or two works of art from the exhibition, um, and then we'll open for a wider discussion. So without further ado, um, I welcome um, Fereshte Daftari to join the conversation. I'll just introduce the three panelists quickly. 
Fereshte is a scholar and curator. She worked for many years at the Museum of Modern Art. She has um, and is a specialist in art of Iran. It, there's a wonderful show up now, currently in New York, Rebel Jester, Mystic Poet, Contemporary Persians, which uh, Fereshte uh, curated from the Mohammed Afkami collection, who should be familiar to those of you in the UAE. Um, and so we're thrilled that that show is in New York after having been in Toronto. She'll be followed by Vishaka Desai, and Vishaka is currently the senior um, advisor to global affairs at Columbia University. She is has been also the president of the Asia Society in, in her career, as well as working at the um, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. She um, is a dear friend. We were in graduate school together at the University of Michigan, and it's wonderful to have her participate in today's discussion. And she'll be followed by Sarah Neal Smith, who is an assistant professor of art history, theory and criticism at the Maryland Institute um, College of Art. And I got to know Sarah while working on this project and she's been enormously helpful um, and contributed a wonderful essay as did Ferry and, and um, to the catalog and Vishaka participated in an early discussion we had that's also um, reproduced in the catalog. So I'm gonna turn over the mic now to the virtual mic to, to Ferry. I'm trying to get to the first slide. Hmm. Okay. Um, my talk will be on Tanabuli's modernist culture. And you're looking at the two works that I, two examples that I selected. Um, this is weird because I'm, I'm not able to go to my next slides. Yeah, uh, well, um, since the term modernism is, is uh, a shifty term, I think that it's uh, at least briefly, uh, we need to clarify what we mean by it. Uh, as formulated by Clement Greenberg, the American critic, Modernism may be characterized or even caricaturized as a march towards pure abstraction, towards an autonomous uh, aesthetics free from references to the outside world. That is to say, free from stories, human emotions, popular culture, politics, anything except the former properties of the medium. To a certain extent, this narrative applies no, why are we? Yeah, uh, let's, let's stay there. Uh, to a certain extent, this narrative applies to David Smith that you see on the screen on the left. Um, it is composed of purely abstract geometric shapes with no blatant reference to the outside world, except that maybe there is some allusion to the human figure. Uh, this anthropocentric gait is even more pronounced in Tanawuli's ceramic on the right of the same date, where the head mutates into the hand of Hazrat Abbas, severed at the Battle of Karbala, a fundamental reference point to the Shia, for the Shia, and a subject matter Tanobuli shares with a group of artists labeled Sarahune. The work is gendered, as indicated by its title, Shirin, who is a character that comes from literature. In its medium too, the work is quote unquote impure. It is hybrid. The ceramic sculpture incorporates painted marks and found objects such as the beads and a tacky plate depicting a scene from Persepolis, the kind that tourists uh, could buy in Iran. This kind of narrative figuration in, in an artwork of mixed medium is certainly not Greenbergian modernism. I wouldn't mind even calling it uh, postmodernism avant la lettre. 
Iranian artists have a different experience of history, different urges and visions of modernity, depriving them from civilizational expressions that assert a specific culture, history, political context, is denying them the assertion of who they are, of their own idiosyncratic modernity. The work is modernist in the sense that Tanovoli understands it. What he means is something different from tradition, something in his own words, quote unquote, new. Tanovoli prefers the term avant-garde and modern to modernist. This sculpture was made when Tanovoli was living in Minneapolis from 62 to 64. Uh, in an effort to place Tehran in the globalized geography of modernisms, we should not presume that all the works by Iranian modernists were made in that city. Uh, I'd like to go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, now that narrative is back, that gender and class have regained visibility in contemporary art. Now that otherness matters, maybe that's why the exclusion of Iranian artists is very gradually being noted. You're looking at Iranian works which came out of storage, uh, uh, MoMA storage here in New York on the occasion of MoMA's protest against Trump's Muslim travel ban in 2017. You see one work by <clears throat> Tanovoli, <clears throat> front and back, Grigorian and Zenderudi. Okay, so now uh, I'd like to go to the next. Okay, right. Um, so how is Tanovoli's work new and not traditional? Uh, which tradition are we talking about? That's the first question we need to ask. Certainly not the Islamic period when due to Islam's equation of figuration with idolatry, sculpture declined. <clears throat> Let me go to the next one. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, these are a few examples from the Islamic period, uh, which I found in the short survey that Tanovoli himself wrote on, uh, on, on Iranian sculpture. But, but generally, if you look at books on Islamic art, you're rarely going to see a, a, a freestanding sculpture. Next slide, yeah. Uh, but the tradition we're talking about that Tanovoli uh, is sort of opposing, uh, it's the academic tradition. Uh, like for instance, uh, embodied in this sculpture by Sadiri. Uh, both these sculptures are sculptures of poets. The one on the left is uh, Ferdowsi, and the one on the right is, another, is a, just an abstract poet, but with a completely different vocabulary. Um, and so it's, this is really a very personal interpretation of a poet, uh, inspired from Persian mythology and, and local and made with local artifacts. Next one, next slide. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure uh, uh, what I can say is that Tanoboli and his contemporaries, such as the ones you see on the screen, uh, Tabo Taboi and Mohsen Vaziri, they all share the same reaction to the academic tradition, which in painting was represented by Kamal el -Mol. So in this very general sense, it can be said that Tanavoli does represent Iranian modernism. Next slide, please. Uh, Tanovoli shared affinities with the Sarwakhune movement he helped develop. On the left is an actual Sarwakhune, which which gave its name to the movement. And on the right, you see an abstract version of the grill work and locks and locks attached to it by devout believers. Next slide. Uh, yeah. But he is unique in his interest in pre-Islamic art uh, and also in whether it's in Persia or in Mesopotamia. Uh, just as in the Hammurabi stele at the Louvre that you see here, uh, it's a sculpture with basically two sides, front and back. And uh, I, it also displays what can be read as text, text all over this uh, stele. And uh, same here. I mean, uh, after all, we, we can read this as text because that, as the title indicates, it's a tablet. The surface markings may be interpreted as an abstract version of the Achaemenid a cuneiform 
tablets that you see on the left. Uh, Tanavoli's textual abstractions are really too uh, complex and varied uh, to be treated here. So uh, suffice it to say that Tanavoli in the entire history of Iranian modernism is unique in the seamless merging of the ancient period with a contemporary culture tinged with Islamic practices. That makes the work new in the sense modernism is understood by Tanavoli. That's it. Thank you. Hi, so um, thank you, Ferry, for starting us off. Um, and I'm next turning to Vishaka, who will present her. Thank talk. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may we have the presentation, please? Terrific. Um, thank you very much for Ferry for getting us started and Lynn for the amazing exhibition that you put together. It's a really great pleasure also to um, not see, but at least hear from colleagues in Abu Dhabi, because what you're trying to do at NYU Abu Dhabi at the intersection of many different places that come together there is very, very exciting. So how appropriate this show is, especially for NYU Abu Dhabi. So uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, a part of this conversation. The two works that I have chosen are both from the, um, from the exhibition by two masters of the Indian modernist tradition, uh, if you will, tradition, itself sounds like an antithetical to modernism, but indeed it is already part of a long vocabulary that's been developed in India for a while. So one is Virgin Night by Makbul Fida Hussein, 1964. Uh, Hussein also has connection to that part of the world by the fact that the last years of his life in a very sad way, he actually had to leave India and made Qatar his home. The other work that I want to focus on is uh, by, and may I have the next slide please, by Francis Newton Souza. There you go, so that's our um, other image. The reason why I chose these two images is that not so much that um, their dates are 1964, 1971. What I am interested in is that both of them part of the original group called the Progressives at the time of India's independence are really the group of people who begin to question what a new country should have as the kind of a way to think about art that crosses boundaries, that goes beyond what would be narrowly defined as nationalistic picture. And that is in direct um, opposition, if you will, to the so-called Bengal school that was always looking to India's past to find the new vocabulary that would be artistic vocabulary that is appropriate for India, the nation. These are the group of artists who are actually looking to go beyond that and to fight against the idea of nation as only made up of its past, but the nation that looks to the future. And that was very much a part of some of the questions that were going on in independent India at the time in late 1940, uh, at the time of independence, 1947. What is very interesting is that they thought of themselves as revolutionary. The word progressive, the way we use it today, actually they had thought about that as what would it look like to be progressive that is future oriented, that breaks the boundaries, that actually breaks from traditions to find something new and what vocabulary it should have. What is very interesting is that by the time some of us came into the field in the late 70s, early 80s, by that time, all of these artists in the West were received primarily as the words that one might use 
provincial, derivative, uh, too much looking like something else so that people might say, oh, Sousa is a little bit too much like Francis Bacon or Picasso too much like, uh, uh, or rather Hussein too much like uh, Picasso. And therefore, as if having no agency to this work. This is also the kind of work that was not studied very much, especially in the West at all, because they were just relegated to a level of derivative, provincial, not creative enough as far as the Western uh, kind of art history was concerned. What is very interesting to me is that if you think about the birth of modernism and not the Gleenbergian way, which is what Ferry was talking about, if you talk about the early masters, such as Van Gogh, and can we have the next slide, please? Uh, we, we would know that whether it's Vincent van Gogh, who actually was inspired so much by Japanese prints, he has written a lot about the fact that, in fact, he had plastered his walls in the studio with Japanese prints that gave him so many different ideas about how to make a picture and how to change the frame in which the work would be done, whether it's abstraction of the bridge, as you see here. This is actually by Van Gogh at the Van Gogh Museum. And the print, uh, this is a very well-known print, to use the Japanese idea as sources of inspiration that actually might not look quite like the Japanese art, but you can see the sources of Japanese print. And can we have the next, please? And it very clearly comes out of what he's looking at. But when we use the words he is inspired by, he is actually looking to prints as sources for his own imagination to create something new that is very personal, is a kind of thing that we talk about with agency given to the artists as to what they're selecting, what they're choosing. And this goes also for Picasso. So in fact, going beyond the Greenbergian notion of modernist, Picasso and people like artists like Van Gogh are looking far and wide for how they're going to create new image. So can we have the next, please? So when we think about Picasso and the portraiture that he's doing in 1905, this is before his encounter with African art. And the first time when he sees um, African art, we know now that it was actually at the home of Gertrude Stein, where he is bowled over by the image he sees. And then he goes to uh, Trocadero Museum of Ethnology, which is, of course, also known as the Musée de l'Homme. And he goes with his friend, and he actually talks about how this was crucial and transformative for him. And can we have the next, please? And this is what happens after 1906, between 1906 and 1909, he completely changes his vocabulary. And this is what he has to say about how he was affected by the collection at the Musée de l'Homme. And he talks about starting as a, a smell of mold and neglect grabbed me by the throat. I was so depressed that I would have chosen to leave immediately, Picasso says of the museum visit. But then he goes on to say, but I forced myself to stay, to examine these masks, all these objects that people had created with a sacred and magical purpose to serve as intermediaries between them and the unknown and hostile forces that surrounded them, thereby trying to overcome their fears, giving them color and shape. And then, and this I think is so important, and then I understood what the painting really meant. It is not an aesthetic process. It is a form of magic that stands between us and the hostile universe, a means of taking power, imposing a form on our terrors as well as our wishes. The day I understood that, I found my way. Now, what is profound about this is that 
he goes to the essence of these forms. And much is written about the primitivism and modernism, but what's very important is how the artists are looking to other forces, to other ways. They're breaking out of their current conventions to create new vocabulary, to find something beyond the representation or beyond the kind of verity of representation, as you saw in the earlier form. So then, when we come back to uh, the two images under consideration, and can we have the next, please? I think it's worth thinking about what it is that these artists are doing as these people who are breaking out of the mold. They too are breaking out of two different molds, exactly what Ferry was talking about. And that is one mold was about the neo-nationalist tradition that was developing as part of the independence movement, i.e the Bengal school, whereby people are looking to Ajanta, they're looking to softer, earlier thematics that come out of the Indian myths and ethos of the Indian tradition. The other one that was very prominent at the time was actually the fine art school trained and developed through the British system that was still very much about representation in the Western style. And here are the artists who are saying, none of this will work for us. For a new nation, we need to create new kind of energy. And where they find this energy is in the kind of abstraction that was going on in the mid 20th century. So the abstraction that goes beyond specificity, again, I go to Clement Greenberg, is actually something that these artists are also interested in. But there is also an agency to this, which is actually national agency, to create new art that will go beyond the cultural specificity of a place. And at the same time, we also know for Sousa, for example, that he was a rebellious spirit right from the get-go. He was kicked out of St. Xavier's College. He was kicked out of JJ School of Art. So that while he's training, he's always pushing hard to go beyond and he's chafing at breaking out of the mold. When he's doing that, that is not to say that he's not inspired by the Indian traditions or Indian thoughts. This particular work called Trimurti, this is done much later than the 1940s that I'm talking about, but his vocabulary is very much trying to look at ways that he, you think about the Indian tradition. So for example, Trimurti, the minute you hear that word in the Indian uh, context, you would immediately think about the Trimurti of Shiva, three-headed Shiva, at the cave of Elephanta, it's six early seventh century sculptures, amazingly part of the Indian nationalist ethos because it became very important in looking at how Indian images would inform the new nation. And yet that notion of Trimurti, which has a very quiescent kind of a face, this is nothing like the Trimurti of Elephanta, but at the same time, it is about three dimensions of a psychological self, a person who is actually trying to struggle with multiplicity within himself. And this is particularly important because by the time India is independent, soon thereafter, he has trouble with the police, He's still fighting ways and he's quite uh, disillusioned, leaves India, goes to London, and then has time in London and then, then spends time in New York. But the ideas that he's inspired by continue to have some reference to India. And yet it is not about India. It's about creating a personal psychological self and creating a different kind of magic which is not unlike what Picasso is asking. So the question is that there is an agency, there's a conscious choice of making the kind of work that these artists are doing, as is also true of uh, Hussein. And can we have the next slide, please? So Hussein, even more so than Sousa, is continuing to play this role of being in between cultural specificity and transnational language. Um, and this particular work, Virgin Knight, 
again, 1964, more than a decade after India has gained its independence. But he's constantly playing with Indian themes, Western uh, forms. Uh, yes, it has certain cubistic kind of an idea, but he too, who was trained in with other artists, Bendre is one of the sources, uh, who was the professor in Baroda, spends a lot of time in Baroda, is making posters, partly uh, film posters, and film itself becomes a kind of a modernist ethos for new India, and film becomes a very important part of how India is projecting itself, not just nationally, but internationally. Um, and this is something that Hussein is very involved with. I think that what is important to me is that, and I, I play guilty to having bought into the earlier ways that people looked at this work, and that is it looks too much like something else. And therefore, we give no agency to this artist. But I have to admit and recognize that the minute you kind of say, well, it's derivative, it's only based on something else, is that it is in itself a kind of a neo-colonial mentality. And what I mean by that is the colonial practice in the mid 20th century and early 20th century, especially in India, was very much to say ancient India was amazing. We are recovering that. The current situation in India is really not very strong and it has fallen down and we, the colonial power, the British, are going to now recover what is special about India that goes all the way back to the um, pre uh, Mughal period and pre-Mughal period. So then, post-47, we continue to play this role that if it is not specifically Indian looking, it can't be very strong. But if it's too Indian looking, it's too provincial. So the only phrases we constantly use was derivative or provincial. What we come back to is a modernist ethos in this picture is no different from Van Gogh or Picasso. There is a conscious choice of how they're looking beyond their borders, breaking conventions, and out of that creating a form that actually feels both personal, national, and global. So we need to give, and that is where the world is changing today, to create this idea of many modernisms. And I think that it's a question of agency, question of breaking conventions, question of abstraction that is both specific and non-specific. And artists and their art refuse to be put into small categories, and that's what we have to do now, to rethink what are the kind of ways that we look at this material. And that's what this show does. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vishaka. Um, we will now move to Sarah Neal um, and uh, welcome her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, good morning from Baltimore. Um, and yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Deftari and Dr. Desai for those presentations. And also, of course, the whole um, it, Abu Dhabi team for all of the logistical help and, and um, getting this wonderful event going. Um, I've been in dialogue with Lynn and the Gray Art Gallery for a couple of years now about this show, and it's so exciting to see um, it take on a new life. I just wish I could be there um, in person. And I just wanted to emphasize from the outset that it's still pretty unusual to have um, exhibitions that are really transnational in this way. And that's one of the kind of amazing things that the Gray um, collection allows us to do is trace, as you can see here, um, through the sort of experience of Gray's journeys, trace these transnational connections in art history um, as well. But of course, there are uh, lots of national specificities. And I wanted to focus in today on this artwork um, by a Turkish artist called Six Lines of Abstracted uh, calligraphy. It's a work on paper. You can see it's quite small. I'm showing it as it's currently installed in the gallery in Abu Dhabi. Um, and it was made in 1960 by an artist named Abedin El Derogo. Um, 
Abdirulu was born in 1901, and like many Turkish artists, he studied in Paris in the 1930s, um, returned to Turkey, um, and then spent most of his career teaching art in secondary schools. Um, this is a piece that he made after his retirement in 1954, when he really deepened his personal artistic practice and experienced quite a lot of success actually at um, the international biennials that were then proliferating. So from Sao Paulo uh, to Tehran, and this artwork is from that kind of prolific period of his work. I wanna pause briefly on these biographical details. I think they're important to keep in mind because he also uh, witnessed a very important historical phenomenon, um, which is of course the collapse of the Ottoman Empire uh, after World War I and the establishment of the Turkish Republic and in 1923, which means he had a very particular relationship to language and to the calligraphic script the question of calligraphic forms that you see here. Um, like all uh, Turkish citizens of his generation, he grew up writing and reading Ottoman Turkish in the Arabic script, and then learned an entirely new script, that is to say the Latin alphabet, um, which was then used for um, modern Turkish in his 20s, so really as an adult. It's a work on paper. Um, as I mentioned, you can see here these uh, kind of number of forms evoke this question of script. He've got, he's got these black uh, ink pen outlines um, using watercolor in and around the forms. Um, the horizontal kind of linear format invokes script. Um, this kind of intimate scale is like a book or a document. You're sort of invited to potentially read uh, this uh, artwork as much as you are to view it as a purely visual form. Um, and when you spend some time with this one, I think the thing that is so fascinating about uh, this work is that it almost seems to dissolve as each of the six lines progress from more and more script-like forms at the top um, to more and more image-like forms um, at the bottom. So you can see that um, this first line here um, really resembles um, a form written in the Ottoman or uh, Arabic script more generally here, starting in the upper right with an elif-like form. Um, as if you are about to read a text here um, from right to left. Um, the second line still resembles script in some way, but we begin to get bodies and figuration entering in here. Um, and by the third, fourth and uh, fifth lines, you kind of lose this sense of directionality or the act of reading almost entirely. Um, instead, you begin to get what I think we could read of potentially as scenes and actually also often scenes that um, I think demand reading not from right to left, but potentially from left to right. So a sort of reversal in the act of reading. So this one here from the fourth line, to my eye, it looks like we have here um, on the right, um, maybe a boat, a steamship coming in here from the right, the second form, um, maybe figures rushing in from the left here. Um, and then this bottom line to me, where you can see uh, Adero's signature there below, um, looks like some kind of arbor or overhanging structure uh, with individual individuals underneath. So in other words, I think one way to potentially read this uh, painting is as a kind of dissolution of script into image. <clears throat> so um, what this means, I think, is that this is um, a pretty straightforward example of what the scholar Iftikhar Dadi has called calligraphic modernism, of course, also um, frequently referred to as hurufiya, um, in which to quote Dadi's uh, definition, um, artists across the Middle East in North Africa, quote, reworked Arabic calligraphic motifs in entirely new ways, particularly uh, in the three decades of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and in affiliation with a whole uh, array of different sociopolitical processes, um, conjoining experiences of decolonization and nation building. Um, so in many areas, 
um, artists' use of such script-like forms um, was a way to reclaim language, to reclaim identity, um, often in relation to European colonial incursions, um, but also as a way to move on from the long imperial legacy of the Ottoman Empire in that broader region. Um, in Turkey, though, where uh, El Dirlu was working, um, the situation was quite different um, because not only um, did Turkey um, under the nationalist ruler Atatürk um, obliterate the kind of entire Ottoman political system in 1928, uh, leadership also obliterated the uh, Ottoman script and language. And this is a 1928 propaganda poster that um, I love just for how concisely it really um, expresses um, this larger process. So um, you can see, first of all, its kind of main message is to uh, convince and explain to a general population this uh, broader impulse of the language reform. Um, so noting here, the old script was very difficult. Uh, the new script has made it easier to read and write. And you can see in this upper register of the poster that I've outlined in red there, um, the way it's making this argument is showing um, the kind of condensation or reduction of uh, the way in which multiple, uh, the same letter might be written in multiple scriptural forms has now been distilled down to a single letter in uh, the Latin alphabet. Um, this led, of course, for a time to quite literally uh, millions of people uh, being illiterate and a large scale kind of really truly generation and nation defining experience and social process um, of learning to read again. Um, and this is a kind of larger process that the historian Hane Ulmaz has written a wonderful uh, book about. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend that. Um, this here is an image of one of the other ways that this uh, uh, large scale change was undertaken, which was through these um, political uh, public campaigns in public parks, um, uh, posting the new um, regulated alphabet. So I think what we have to do here then is read El Derolo's uh, version of calligraphic modernism in light of this specific history. And um, I think we can consider this artwork and the way that it sort of seems to figure the dissolution of an Ottoman Arabic script as asking a question, which is to say, what if your home country has actually tried to abolish these particular forms? How should an artist like El Derolo, um, working in a very distinct post-Ottoman context, treat these forms in the visual arts? And I think that the answer this artwork gives is to propose that perhaps the visual arts can serve as a space in which to work through or refigure or negotiate this larger historical experience that El Derolo's generation had been defined by, this process of learning to read again of both the loss and the acquisition um, of a language as a result of that 1928 language reform. Um, I will just say, if you try sort of scanning each line, either from right to left or left to right with your eyes, depending on which script you can read, you may find sort of different sticking points in that viewing process. And in that sense, I think we can read this kind of um, dissolution of the script uh, from script-like forms into imagistic ones as part of this personal, generational, national experience that uh, El Derolo had himself also undergone. This is actually something that you see in the work of other uh, Turkish modernists. So I think we can um, also build out from there, not just um, El Derolo's work, but a larger body of um, Turkish modernist painting that connects to this idea of calligraphic modernism in a larger sense, in which you see works by artists like Cemal Bingöl or Şemsettin Aral, in which you can sort of read them either from left to right or right to left. It's an attempt, I think, to use visual form in some ways to reconcile or simultaneously figure 
um, that larger experience of learning to read again, or the kind of diglossia that uh, um, results from the experience of having a multi script, um, uh, having the capacity to read in multiple scripts at the same time. Um, I will end here um, back in the gallery um, to uh, hand it over now to Lynn um, for our final portion of the event. Thank you, Sarah Neal. So I'm gonna invite my other colleagues or Vishaka and um, Ferry to come back um, on screen. Um, I think it's been fabulous to be able to have these brief deep dives as they were limited, of course, um, by time um, and to insights into the various aspects of these multiple modernisms. Um, I will say that for me, it's been an ongoing learning curve since I became director at the Gray and that it's an enormous gift to be able to learn about these various modernisms from the vantage point of the artworks themselves. Um, so I'm gonna pose just a few questions um, and I'd like you all to respond briefly um, just to, to leave our audience with some ideas to think further about. But um, Ferry, we began working um, around 2000 or even 1990 on the first exhibition that the Gray mounted um, as when I was um, at the helm between word and image, um, modern Iranian visual culture. And for that, you pen the wonderful essay, Another Modernism in Iranian Perspective. How has scholarship changed in terms of the past um, two decades? Um, in terms of, of approaches to modernism, in your case, Iran, Vishaka, in your case, India, and Sarah, Neil, in your case, Turkey. So, uh, Fereshti, can you quickly lead us off? Sure. Um, well, I have to say that, unfortunately, art history of Iranian art is still in its infancy. Um, of course, back when we I started to work with you around 1999, 2000, um, there was a, a lot of information in what was in, in the writings, but the writings were mostly by Iranians who were um, uh, not necessarily art historians. They were critics, they were coming from other fields. And um, the writings really had a lot of information that, that you could get uh, ideas from, but it was not really a sort of scholarly project that they pursued. And since that, I mean, I had really a lot of difficulty doing the research for that essay uh, because of the slack. But I have to say that uh, what has been written on Iranian modern art it's, has been focused on the contemporary period more than the modern period. Uh, on modernism, Frankly, there's still very few uh, solid works produced. Um, you, we have two uh, additional um, surveys, and then there's my own book that's not really a survey, it's a series of essays. And then uh, there is um, uh, one book by uh, um, Montazami, it's a monograph on Behjat uh, Esad that's in English. Otherwise, in French, we have uh, a, a book on the pioneers, the, the, the artists from the 40s and the 50s. And uh, in Iran, there was a book published by uh, Del Zende, which is not really uh, art history in, the, in a general sense, but it's more. Uh, based on, on, on theory. So it's a theoretical kind of a review of uh, um, the development from the Qajar period to through the 70s. And so we, we are still basically lacking simple monographs or catalog raisonnés. We don't have dates, we don't have, it's still a lot of work needs to be done. Okay, thank you. I think it's interesting that you bring up and we talked about this earlier, the focus more on contemporary. There's been a lot more literature and a lot more um, 
shift focus and attention play to that. Vishaka, you're nodding. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that's really worth thinking about is that why is it that it's easier for people to lap on to contemporary? Because partly that contemporary language is part of the globalizing language. Globalization is part of ours. And it all begins essentially in the early 1990s. And you can kind of understand that. So that I think when it comes to mid-century work, 50s, 60s, from these different parts, because the visual language looks so similar to the kind of Western look, it's it's almost like saying that because the language is similar, it must be derivative. And I've always used the example that just because I wear Western clothes doesn't peg me only as a Western person. And that's one of the problems. It's a formal language looks like one way. So we don't interrogate enough to look at where the other questions are. And so I would say in the 20 years that these 30 years that's been going on now, um, that in India, unlike Iran, there's been a fair amount of writing. You know, Gita Kapoor, lots of people have Swaminathan, K.G. Subramaniam, they've all written about this period. It's just that in the West, except for Gita, none of the people paid any attention to the writings by the Asian scholars. So part of the problem is, whose writing gets done. And it goes back to, we know today that 80% of the things get cited in contemporary literature, no matter what the field is, is all Euro-American. So there is something about the colonial legacy that continues to be what we privilege, what we don't. At the same time, I think we need the voices from different parts to look at this, to question, and to really kind of create new forms of scholarship. So Pepe, you know, just put in the question that how does Sousa's idea change how we might look at the traditional Trimurti? And the one thing I will say is that by looking at Sousa's picture, and when I was thinking about this particular work and looking at the elephant imagery, is actually to remind us that both of them are looking at the psychological conditions within ourselves. Even that sixth century image is about looking at different dimensions of the self. But Sousa, by going to the essence of it, reminds you of that, of putting that personal and psychological in. Thanks, Vishaka. I mean, I think this is why it's so important also that we have places like the NYUAD Institute to bring together scholars and relook at these things. Sarah Neal, can you kind of give a quick response to the state of scholarship? Yeah. I, would I would just echo later. I would just echo what both um, Ferry and Vishaka were saying. First, the um, the question of the focus on the contemporary is very certainly very relevant for um, work on Turkey. Um, uh, and then uh, Vishaka's point about there's quite a bit of scholarship in Turkish or coming out of um, the Turkish uh, context, but that doesn't always necessarily get the citations or traction. Um, the, the two other things I would add there, one is that um, in terms of this particular national tradition, there are now increasingly um, PhD students in the US working on this, which is still yeah. quite a new development, even just the last three to five years. Right. So very, very... Um, much an unfolding subfield. Um, and then the other uh, kind of main hallmark, I would say, um, one of the reasons I chose the um, El Derolo artwork is because it really spans, I think, the Ottoman, the national, and a post-national uh, or a, a more mid-century, let's say, moment. Um, and that break between the Ottoman and the national has just really, really dominated, um, I think, art historical scholarship as an idea of this very strong moment of rupture. And I think the sort of next direction I see scholarship going is thinking about continuities as much as, as a rupture there. Thank you. Um, we're unfortunately running out of time. I think we can go for a few minutes more. Um, I, but I wanted to add something sure. to, uh, you know, Vishaka was talking about uh, the fact that the art that was perceived as derivative was not looked at 
in the West. Uh, but I think that even when the art was absolutely not derivative, it still was not looked at by the West. Right. You know, uh, like for instance, in Iran, you have this, uh, the, the, the first culturally specific modernist movement called Sapa Khune. Uh, even recently, there were some works that were still available for museums to buy. Even now, today, with all the interest in otherness, in people of color, in the non-Western world, nobody paid any attention. So uh, that's no, what I wanted still, to do. This is still such a rich area. Um, I came to it personally from um, having studied modernism in Jim, uh, Japan and being astonished when I first traveled there, the range of works that I saw in museums that I had no idea about um, had, and had had the privilege of seeing. So let's hope that um, our vistas broaden um, and that we begin to engage in more discussions like this one, um, where we can look and compare and contrast that there are more both surveys and solo shows, um, both by country. I still think we can still learn. Um, and then also more monographic presentations um, so we can delve a little bit more deeply. Um, I do hope that everybody um, in the UAE at least um, gets to see the exhibition there. Um, you know, one of the things that we weren't able to touch upon was one, um, just the the huge topic that we're trying to to look at in a in a brief span of time. But also the both the negatives and the positives of do, trying to do this via one collection. Um, and when you see the show, you have to question also what Abby Gray uh, didn't collect. Um, and it, that takes us into a whole nother topic. You know, I mean, there, there are so many different ways to look at the exhibition, but one is cultural diplomacy, the Cold War, um, the politics, the, you know, um, all the stuff that was going on in the 60s and 70s when she was in, in, uh, on her mission to, um, to facilitate discussion. So I want to thank everybody for um, participating. Um, thank NYU AD and um, Maya Allison at the NYU AD Art Gallery for inviting us to, to discuss this. Maya, do you want to close out maybe with some of the more programs that, um, that are coming up? Um, I am not ready to announce those yet, but we are lining up programs for most for all of January and the gallery is open uh, Sunday through Saturday, no, Monday through Saturday, 12 to 8 free. Um, we really hope you'll join us and anyone who wants to get more information or if you're not able to visit, for example, if you're watching from outside the UAE, um, please just still be in touch. We're happy to send you exhibition install views, which we will eventually post on the website as well. I really enjoyed this conversation and I learned so much. Um, and I'm uh, now going to go and read everything I can find <laughs> that I haven't already read on these artists. So thank you so much. Yeah, we had really hoped um, to take some questions from the audience, um, but we the technical difficulties have um, made that um, a little bit more difficult. Vishaka mentioned one from our colleague Pepe Carmel here at NYU, um, specifically about one of the works. And I see we also have one, why call it modernism and not nationalism. Um, so, you know, again, um, hopefully um, we can continue these discussions in other formats. Um, it's, it's, I want to thank everybody for, for, tuning in. And um, again, thank our colleagues for hosting this and for um, negotiating time differences and uh, various levels of skill um, from those of us in terms of digital um, expressions. But please, please do go to the show and check out the website. There's lots of information. Um, the Gray Art Gallery has um, some uh, has also some recorded talks and presentations that we hosted um, when the show was here in 2019. 
I'm actually speaking to you from uh, going back in time. I'm virtually in the exhibition as we had it in New York um, and encourage you to explore both websites um, and find more and continue to look and question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. <laughs>